you know, so I have this bag of like all the books that I bought and I get to talk to Thomas King and I'm so excited. And I walk past him to sit down and my bag like whips him in the face. To the delight of my grade 10 drama class, I once fell right off the stage. I spent my 40s fighting not to need a crutch and my 50s resisting a walker. A face plant into a moving streetcar changed my mind. At 63, my walker and I collided with a kilted, hammer-throwing Highlander at the Fergus Scottish Festival. When he stepped over my face to help me up, it forever settled the pressing question of Scottish manhood and gave new meaning to the phrase, getting off scot-free. But if you're expecting an inspiring tale about the importance of getting back up, you'll be disappointed. Here's my truth. I'm a faller and will always be one. Falling makes me bloody furious and it makes me furiously bloody proud. Now that I understand exactly what makes me fall, I know what I can and can't do about it. I'm learning to retrace my scarred history, to channel shame into solidarity, anger into analysis, denial into delight, and loss into love. After half a century of falling down, I'm falling up. I'm falling for myself. Almost human is a role I refuse to play. I'm a disabled whole. I'm not so lame. I'm splendidly lame, magnificently lame. In short, all four foot 10 of me won't be telling you an inspiring tale about defeating or overcoming disability. Mine can't be hidden, halted or healed. We all need to stop falling for the double lie that disabled people can be healed or should want to be healed. And the, the one thing that, that I've taught creative writer writing as a part-time teacher for, I'm finished now, but almost close to 30 years. And I always say to my students, do you want to be a writer or do you want to write? Mm -hmm. Writing is something that, that, that you give to yourself passionately. Being a writer is a persona. I'm not particularly interested in the persona. Mm -hmm. And so when I sit down to write, I, I genuinely try to write a better book than I've written before, which doesn't mean that I get there. Mm -hmm. I'm not dismissing affirmation, right? We, we, we all want to be affirmed. We all want, want somebody to say, good job, buddy, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but at the same time, that's pretty ephemeral. I mean, I, I, I looked at a list of Pulitzer Prize winners just out of curiosity one time. You don't recognize 90% of the names on there. And, 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 and really great writers often won for their worst books. Um, so I, I know this is an ambivalent answer to the question. Um, I'm, I'm happy with the affirmation, mm -hmm. but but when, I think the work is the most important thing, mm -hmm. and it's doing the work that's the most important thing. That's a beautiful answer. It's very wise and grounded, and you can see all of us nodding frantically. <laughs> so yeah, that was very well put. Thank you. And I, I like memoir because it's also very close to something else that I really enjoy, which is the which is gossip um, and <laughs> salacious. Yeah. You know, you get to kind of really talk about things that people would rather keep behind closed doors. And um, and that part is really fun. Of course, you have to be a little careful because you don't want to get sued. Um, and uh, I'm kind of broke, so they wouldn't get much. But I mean, I just couldn't afford the legal fees. Um, so you have to you have to tread lightly um, so that, you know, it helps to change names. And uh, yeah, and it's also it's it's very therapeutic. You get to rid yourself of a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. And uh, show, show, I get to show myself that it is possible to write something um, that is both tender and 
meets my own expectations of what I consider to be like decent writing. So. Well, I think you've done that in spades in your in your novel or in your memoir. Thanks, Lyndon. I like what you said about gossip. I'll say quickly. I like what you said about gossip, and I once read a description of Alice Monroe as goss- gossip inspired by genius, and I think that's something to strive for. And write in book gossip inspired by genius. Yeah, I was. I was just going to say, um, writing a memoir kind of scared me because it's a little bit self indulgent in the sense that you have to write it on the assumption that somebody actually cares what you think and somebody actually will want to read what your experience was. And so you kind of, it scared me a little bit because I, my inner voice said, why would, why would anybody care what you think? Um, and maybe they do and maybe they don't. Um, but I also kind of liked what Mohammed said. I kind of liked the idea of spilling the tea a little bit about, um, how things really are and people have said to me you know you you write very honestly um i think it's because i'm not creative enough to make stuff up which is why i don't write novels um but i i kind of like the idea that um it did involve having to put myself out there a little bit and people can either like it or not i hope they like it but if they don't um you can't also you really can't argue with a memoir like this is what really actually happened so, you know, it's one thing if you write a novel and somebody says, I didn't like your characters or I didn't enjoy the story you came up with. Well, with a memoir, this is what really happened. So if you don't like it or not, this is now a historical account of something that occurred. Um, so, you know, it's not really something you um, you can say, you know, do better next time because this is just, this is how it was. So that's kind of freeing too. Yeah, um, I like. I just want to say to Lyndon that I like um, what you said about. Um, oh gosh, sorry, my mind is just doing a blank. The note popped up in the chat, which distracted me. But um, about worrying that it's too self-centered or it's too narcissistic, and who wants to read my story? And why I felt struggled that a lot because I have a very ordinary life, and so I'm like, oh, who cares? And I don't want to seem narcissistic or like I think everybody wants to read about me. So in my case, I like the kind of books that we've researched in. So. In the hockey mom book, I write about youth sports from the experts. Mm-hmm. And in the, in the hiking book, I write about how to overcome shyness and build confidence in girls and the effect of getting out of nature and weave the research through. And so in my mind, as I was writing, I was like, well, the personal story and the sharing and the intimacy pulls readers into the story. But then I'm also saying, but here's some research, too, so that mm-hmm. that helps me not feel like I'm being too narcissistic or too, um, you know, self-indulgent. But then I've had readers both ways. I've had readers who say, oh, I love the research and that added so much to the book. And I've had other people who said the research was distracting and we just wanted to read your story. So no matter what you do, and that's why it's smart to not read reviews, people are going to like it and people are going to not like it. The Red Chesterfield. There is a Red Chesterfield in the ditch at the end of the road. Some may call it a sofa or even use a more common American vernacular, a couch. But it's obviously a Chesterfield, big enough to seat three, possibly four adults, too small to be a sofa. And even though it is top haphazardly into the dish, there's a formality to the piece. Maybe it's a Davenport design, but when one looks at it, the word couch does not come to mind. Couch denotes an informality, like one of those ubiquitous black leather couches in which young men play video games, watch sports and spill their beers and snacks. This, that is a couch. The object in the ditch is a Chesterfield, red, which is what I write in my notebook, noting the location, time and date, red Chesterfield. The yard sale. Are you connected in any way to that red Chesterfield? What the fuck are you talking about? The man turns and sees my uniform and changes his language. Sorry, I didn't see you there, he says. I notice that despite his apology, the dismissive tone in his voice is still present. He speaks with an Eastern European accent, and despite my efforts not to do so, I immediately try to place it. Polish? Ukrainian? Belarusian, perhaps. But I quickly brush aside those prejudiced thoughts. Can I help you, the man says. The question is immediately followed by a series of deep hacking coughs and the spitting of some phlegm, possibly some type of pulmonary obstruction disease, I think. He's turned to face me, hands on hip, to look more threatening, but despite the many threats I face for my ticket writing, no one has ever physically assaulted me. Do you know anything about the Red Chesterfield, I ask, pointing down the end of the road. He squints in his direction. Nothing to do with me, he says, coughing and spitting once more. I know he's only pretending to see. I note that and then look at his yard. Yes, this is the place that was reported. Elegy for water and ourselves. 
Water the color of sky on a kind day we celebrate. Water the rose opaque of smoke when there are forest fires we regard with caution and may secretly admire. Water the hue of poos clouds in the gloom of wet weather and the color of the raw earth it travels through in river arteries and veins visited by the green populations that make it their summer home, we might ignore. Water traveling our arteries past rocks and waterfalls or back up the blue estuaries <coughs> to enter the heart's valves and chambers. Water is our medium. Without it, there is no life, no movement towards or away. Water is our source, crystal as first lakes, Chlorine ammonia tasting today in silver taps, or at its most elemental, drinking through the long, cool throat of a well on a hot day. But water is all colors, and every well has its taste and darkness, and each district's character reflects ourselves. Our sewage effluent, or agricultural runoff, pesticides, or Roundup, Iron or mercury, arsenic slurry or PCB tailings from the mines, a rainbow slick on the water's mirror from the metal shunt carrying black blood under a major river artery. All we have consumed, antibiotics last Wednesday or estrogen in pills a decade ago, insulin daily or ephedrine seasonally, Prozac or Red Bull that has traveled through our bodies and been rejected subsumed in the lagoon of liver and kidney, returns to the water that feeds us, muddying or complicating, altering its essence, our essence. And so water that is our life may be our destruction, and we may be our own destroyers. One of my earliest memories, uh, on the floor, underneath the table, um, coal oil lamps, and I was copying the letters from the Winnipeg Free Press onto a brown paper bag with a little stub of a pencil. I was four years old. I was teaching myself to read and write. I've been a writer ever since. When I was in my teens, I was writing poetry. I believe the world would be saved by 13-year-old poets. <laughs> when I was in the Navy and working in the mining camps, I was writing short stories. And all through that, I told myself I was practicing. Mm -hmm. I'm just practicing. And a lot of the writing that I did, especially the short stories, were practice. Just practice and practice and practice. A lot of my work have to do with personalization of objects around me. That is how I view the world. Yeah, um, from a young age, I would, because we were left alone in the village, I would sit down and I would be with rocks and things would be going on all around me. I would not pay attention to what was going on, but I would listen to what they're saying. And even though I wasn't looking at them, I would look at the rocks in front of me 
and put their quality <laughs> into the rocks. So the rocks became more of my friends than the actual people standing there. And it was a weird, quirky thing that I did as a kid. But as I grew up, it developed into a writing style um, for my poetry. And that's why influence is a big thing. Like when I sit down and I'm um, with trees, I'm sitting down with trees. When I take a moment, a story is already forming just by the environment that is there. So mm-hmm. people ask me that, uh, what's your inspiration? And of course, it would be it would be safe to say nature, but it's not really nature. It's how nature is relating to us, how nature is relating to everyone. It's not just talking about different kinds of trees. It's talking about the qualities that are in the trees that are also seen in humans. And that's that's the way that I view it. Um, it's also a very big fact that um, whenever they ask a, a, a a black poet or artist what their inspiration is, there it's the expected answer would be, oh, the politics that is mm. going on and the world politics. But very rarely do I talk about those kind of things. Instead, I, I like to talk about self-love, inner turmoil that is going on because if everyone feels that no matter in the skin color, everyone has feelings of mental illness. The the difference might be how you got that mental illness, but you still <laughs> you still have it, right? Um, so that's why there's a very mixed um, emotions with um, asking about what inspiration is. Genocide love. My children were taken from me. My mother took them into her care, and I was on a police order to not go near my mother's home. My husband left me for someone else. By this time, there were no more chances for me. I quit my business college studies. I walked around in blackouts and woke up in strange places. Once I found myself driving down the highway on the wrong side of the road. I had lost everything, my children, my husband, my home, my job, and my self-respect. I had no one. My only consolation was that my, my children were safe with their grandmother. Myrtle, do you think you have a problem with alcohol? Asked a lady from the crisis service center. I cried and for the first time admitted, yes, I do have a problem. I was taken to the hospital and was registered in a detox center for a month. Slowly, I got my life back. I found a job and got a new apartment. After a year, I was able to see my children, providing I attended parenting classes to learn some parenting skills and self-help groups to build positive self-esteem. I went back to university. It was a struggle, but I didn't quit. I was determined to make a home for my children and for myself. I completed my degree and found a good job at a bank. The children came home again, and I continued with parenting classes, counseling. I painted beautiful acrylics on canvas, and my creative ability grew. As I succeeded, my children succeeded. The parenting courses helped a lot. I lived off the food bank and welfare until I was set in my career, but I found good work after finishing university, and I vowed never to be on welfare again. I wanted my children to have everything, and they did. I never wanted them to go hungry like I did in the boarding school. My home was filled with love and protection for my children. They had a good home, wore the best clothes, and their lives were busy with sports and other activities. Uh, For me personally, I think the question was, um, you try and break the mold or you try and fulfill audience expectations. My feeling now, um, I, I do my best with it, and I don't always, I don't always succeed. But you know, I, I really just want to have fun when I'm writing. You know what I mean? I know that sounds almost silly or gimmicky, but um, I think after doing it for as long as I have, um, uh, if I'm not having fun, it really shows. You know what I mean? Like I think the work itself, it's obvious. Um, the the books that I've really enjoyed myself writing, uh, obviously you want to say something with your books as well to to whatever degree you can but um in general if i'm enjoying myself um i the the book tends to to work and if that and if you know so i'm not really worried about whether i'm fulfilling audience expectations or whether i'm blocking them it's just a matter of my own enjoyment as i as i work my way through the novel and that usually um bears fruit in the way that the the book feels fresh and and vital whatever way i can make it I, I wanted to add one more thing is that um, 
the idea of audience expectation is, is you know, it, it's important to ask who we think the audience is or who we've been taught the audience is. Mm -hmm. So in, you know, my case, having grown up in the, the 70s and the 80s and the school systems, all the stories I read were about white people. Um, straight white people were the mainstream normative um, subject. Um, and so at that time, I thought that was normal right. um, until I, you know, started to more critically engage with with that um, representation and, and what it was doing socially and historically. And so, um, you know, if I had been guided by um, sort of audience expectation based on that, then uh, you know, I would never draw write myself into the center in so much that I would, you know, want to write stories about straight uh, white people because that's all I ever read. Right. So that was sort of like an audience expectation that I learned um, through the school system. So it's, you know, I think things are getting better now in, in education, in how we learn, how, how we are taught to read, because I don't mean just learning the alphabet and learning to read, but how to decode critically yeah. um, and socially what we are reading, who's written what, why. Um, so I think those are really important considerations as well. For, for As an example, we now have scarlet lily beetles on the prairies, which historically would never have been able to survive the winter here. We, we can grow a lot of perennials and shrubs and plants that as little as 50 years ago we could not grow our climate was way too cold and our growing season was too short there's a lot of perennials that we can get away with now that are out of zone um, because our winters are not as harsh but by the same token we also have more and more pests and diseases showing up that previously were never able to survive here and i am learning as a gardener somebody who immerses myself in this every day how do i deal with dealing with pests that did not evolve in this climate how do we deal with mountain pine beetles that are emerging earlier and getting into forest ranges where they've never gotten before. How do we how do we deal with that? And then I still have every day people saying, what do I spray for this? What kind of pesticide can I use? What toxin can I douse my yard with to deal with this? And I am saying, this is not the problem. The insects that are showing up here are not the problem. The problem is we have fundamentally changed global climate and that's what we need to address. The solution is not to go out and spray something, you know, the solution is that we have to adjust how we live and our lives. We have to adapt in the way that nature adapts. And that is so difficult and we don't have a roadmap for it. And, you know, like people are saying so often to me, well, what do I do about this? And I'm going, well, first, before this is even something we can consider. So it's, it's a really, it's a really hard thing because you pull on one thread and the whole tapestry unravels. Right. Jen? I so agree with you, Lyndon. I think um, getting to the root cause of it is, and looking at other ways to grow food and to source food, such as regenerative agriculture, permaculture, like these techniques that are building soil health rather than dousing everything with toxins and putting a Band-Aid on the situation. I mean, that's, that's human nature to want a quick fix, but it's not helping. And if, when it goes to your food sourcing, if you're not gardening or growing your own food, which a lot of us aren't, the major contributor to pollution and to climate change, it's not cattle, Pro, like, don't listen to the propaganda, it's not cattle, it is major, it's the transport industry and it's big industry. So if you're buying food that is being shipped here from thousands of miles away, unfortunately you are contributing. And so the easiest way to do that and to have an immediate positive impact is to start sourcing just a little bit more of your food within your own community or your own province. And it's really empowering to know you can have that change because we all eat three times a day and we have the ability to enact positive change when it comes to what's happening with the environment. So I met um, Thomas King and I was just like, I just read The Inconvenient Indian and I was like, just, ah, I want to talk to him so bad. And I had this big backpack on because I wasn't an author. I was like an attendee, but they let me into the like author space. And they were like, you know, so I have this bag of like all the books that I bought and I get to talk to Thomas King and I'm so excited. And I walk past him to sit down and my bag like whips him in the face. 
And so I don't even, <laughs> I don't even see it. But I sit down. I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And he's like, oh my god, <laughs> it's like totally like a scratch across his face from this buckle. And I was like. Anyways, devastated. I still laugh about it to this day, but it was not the best first. <laughs> the first part is, is them meeting um, these two Dakota men and the circumstances of that meeting. <clears throat> On the evening of the first day of their journey, it wasn't settlers or anyone from the three nations that the Dumonts encountered on the road to La Prairie Ronde. Instead, it was two Dakota men traveling on horseback who met them on the trail. And it was a lucky thing too. Isidore had been driving the cart when they needed to cross a boggy area in the road. Somehow, a cartwheel became trapped between two rocks hidden in the mud. They tried to use the extra horses to pull the cart free, but the rope broke, and now the women and men had to work together to free the cart. Frederick was the first to notice the Dakota men and was sent to ask them for assistance. The two strangers quickly recognized the trouble and joined in to rescue the cart. While the men rocked the cart back and forth, the women and Frederick were pulling hard on the car cart horse's reins, hoping to free the wheel. A strong push from the four men freed the stubborn wheel, lurching the cart suddenly forward. Frederick let out a loud cheer, which immediately turned to laughter when he saw what had happened to Cocom and Tante Marie Madeleine. The two women had been pulling with all their might and were suddenly thrown backwards into the muck and mire. They were now sitting in the middle of the road, covered in mud. The women shot a disapproving look at Frederick, who was immediately silenced, while the other men looked away, knowing better than to laugh. While the Dakota men led the horse and cart to firmer ground, Gabriel and Isidore helped their shocked wives regain their balance and climb out of the mud hole. When everyone was safe and sound, the men set up camp while the women cleaned themselves up. The Dakota men were thanked and invited to stay for supper. And it was fortunate that the Dumont men spoke several indigenous languages and could communicate easily with the Dakota hunters. Frederick listened eagerly to the conversation between the four men. He learned that they were members of Chief Wapahaska's band and were headed to Moose Woods, where their newly formed reserve was now located. Moose Woods was very close to La Prairie Round, which made the Dakota and Métis neighbors. The Dakota and Métis already had a long-standing relationship of peace and friendship and had even traveled on buffalo hunts together. It seemed today's meeting was meant to be, and they all agreed to continue on their journey together. But, you know, I, I do think it probably has, you know, it's a lot of training and a lot of experience that probably helps with character development. And something that I really sought to do in this latest novel was to, um, to you know, I had my novelist hat on first, but my psychotherapist hat definitely was there in that I was seeking to make sure that I was busting some myths. Mm. Like, so Hollywood has some really weird ideas about trauma and how people remember trauma, which are just like wrong and do a disservice uh, to the world by maintaining those kinds of ideas. So, you know, I, I very much used my psycho, psycho babble um, stuff um, in this novel. Um, to ensure that I was being accurate around emotional, psychological experiences. Yeah. So I think it helps me. You know, I'm always swimming in emotions, like all day long I'm swimming in emotions. And then, um, so it's just part of how I think, how I, how I write probably. Um, one, one thing I like to tell emerging writers is that, um, you know, when they're, when they're kind of looking at how, how do I create a writer life for myself? So for me, I'm a writer in the morning from about 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then I see clients in the afternoon. And that's a really good balance for me. And um, I often say to emerging writers, like, find some kind of job like that, that you can do part time <laughs> that won't suck all of your writer like brain so that you have energy for your writing and time for your writing.
Have a great night. Get home safely. Have some fun tonight.